Good evening, church. It's always good worshiping together with all of you. We're going to continue in the worship of our God and the preaching of His Word. So take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Let's read from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 16. Again, I'm not going to be pre- I'm not going to ex- be expositing this passage, but I feel like it's a good passage for us to uh, read before getting into the subject of pastoral ministry. So, Ephesians chapter four, verse eleven to verse sixteen. Please rise as we honor the reading of God's word. And He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray. Lord God, we know that the church is your church. Jesus, you have shed your blood in order to redeem your people. And upon your work, upon who you are, you have built up the body of Christ uniting us to yourself in the resurrection, Lord, so that together we might be able to grow into him who is the head into you. And Lord, I pray that as we get into the subject of leadership, that you would help us to understand um, the value of pastors, ministers, and that we would care for them, pray for them, we would support them, that the church might be equipped in the work of the ministry for their growth for the glory of the King. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May we seated. All right, so it's been a while um, since I've uh, been talking about the subject of pastoral ministry. So if you guys remember, um, I finished the book of Galatians, and I got into the subject of pastoral ministry, but then I was gone for a couple of weeks for retreats, and then we had our own retreat, and we had a few baptisms as well. And so we're finally back, and I'm going to continue on in the study of this subject. Uh, But I want to do a quick review of what we have covered so far. Uh, We began by talking first about the titles of the pastor. So if you guys remember that, we began by talking about the uh, titles of the pastor. In the Bible, we find that the office of the pastor, the elder, and the overseer, which can also be translated as bishop, is all the same. The office is the same with the same authority, with the same responsibility. And that responsibility is to care for the church. Now, the practical distinctions that are made between the elder and the pastor and the bishop, these things are cultural. Okay, so the the practical differences between elders, pastors, and bishops, these are are cultural differences, artificial differences. Biblically, at the end of the day, they're one and the same. The pastor, elder, the overseer, slash bishop. And this is important because we're not going to have a board of elders. We're not going to have a board of elders and then uh, pastors who are full-time. They're all going to be the same group. And obviously the reason why we're talking about this is because it's going to be in a few months that we uh, appoint Matt as a pastor and uh, elder within this church, God willing. Okay, God willing, uh, that's going to happen. So I want you guys to know how we're going to be operating. I've talked a bit about this during our uh, our, uh, members meeting, but again, I want to flush it out from the Sunday pulpit. Now, um, in that first sermon, we also talked about the role of the pastor uh, slash elder and overseer, and that is to shepherd and to protect the church. That's the goal. That's the purpose. The purpose of the pastor, the minister, is to care for the congregation, to care for their soul, their spirit. And so even though we might come up with uh, different pastoral titles, so you guys may have heard things like music pastor or executive pastor, their main role is not music or administration. Their main role is the church, is caring for you personally. And the responsibility of ministering to the people and the authority that comes along with it is endowed upon every pastor so that a youth pastor should have the same authority as a senior pastor, okay? They should have the same authority because they're, again, pastors, 
people who are overseeing, shepherding, caring for the church. Now, in the second sermon on pastoral ministry, I talked about plurality, the plurality of leadership and some of the misunderstandings surrounding pastoral ministry. Um, the Bible, in the Bible, it's clear when, that, when the leadership was established, it was established in a plurality. Right? And this is effective for a number of reasons. First is it provides accountability for the elders. If there's a place for a person to hide within the church, it's going to be somewhere on top where nobody dares to question, nobody dares to, uh, uh, to check up on the man. And so there, it makes it easier when there are people who are in the same position, uh, checking up on each other, keeping each other accountable, calling each other out. And so the, one of the first reasons why plurality is important is because of accountability. Accountability. Now, the second reason is because of the effectiveness in ministry. The weakness of one pastor is going to be the strength of another pastor. Okay? The weakness of one pastor is going to be the strength of another pastor so that we're going to get each other's weaknesses, get each other's back in that way. And because the church is made up of so many different people with different personalities, um, there's going to be one pastor that you connect with better when there's a plurality. That makes sense, right? So there's some people who connect. Matt can connect with some of you better than I can connect with you. So I, I know that to be the case. And there are some people that Brian can connect to better than I can connect to, and vice versa. And so the plurality is helpful in ministering to the different kinds of people that come to our church, that are in our church. Now, with regards to misunderstanding about pastoral ministry, we first talked about pastoral calling. Most people, when they think about pastoral calling, they think about the spiritual unction uh, given to us by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a mysterious, abstract unction. But in both the Old and New Testament, calling is much more than that. It's prophetic in nature so that God calls a person by revealing himself in a dream or a vision or by audibly calling that person to a specific task. And because God literally calls his servants to do the work of the ministry, that calling cannot be denied. In case in point is Jonah. Jonah tried to deny the call. What happened? He got swallowed up by a fish. What most people label as pastoral calling, when they're talking about pastoral calling, what, as I'm reading the literature, hearing people talk, it just basically sounds like they're talking about a personal conviction given to them by the Holy Spirit. A okay, personal conviction. And that's, that's, that's a good thing. And the thing is, pa the Holy Spirit convicts us of many things and not just pastoral ministry. Okay. So it's not a unique thing in that way. But it's, I, you know, what, that distinction between conviction and calling really needs to be made because if a man chooses to leave the ministry, he is not automatically being unfaithful for, quote unquote, abandoning the call, abandoning what God wants him to do. Okay? As we get ready, and um, God willing, again, bring Matt up on board and future leaders on board to the elder team, I want to make sure that our church creates a culture where when some of these men choose to step down, they don't feel like they're being a disappointment or where you're looking upon them as if they failed, okay? Some people need to step down from pastoral ministry because they're trying to be faithful. They step down from pastoral ministry because they want to honor the Lord. It might be because they want to work on their own spiritual life. It might be because they want to strengthen their family. Or it might be because they feel like somebody else is better fit for the role. But they're stepping down not because they're unfaithful, but they're stepping down because they're trying to be faithful. And so I want our congregation to be encouraging. I want our congregation to be understanding. And a part of that is understanding what calling actually is. Okay? Make sense? The second misunderstanding we clarified is the term ordain. Ordain. Even though culturally we talk about the ordination of a pastor, biblically, the term was only used for priests. So priests were ordained. Now, the office of a priest is not the same as the office of a pastor. The term that more accurately describes the uh, induction of a pastor or an elder is appoint. That's the term that is biblically used. And the reason why it's important to make this distinction between ordination and appointments is because ordination endows upon a man privileges and responsibilities that are excluded for the rest of the lay people. And for the priests, they were endowed with the responsibility to fulfill the work of intercession and atonement through sacrifices. 
This was a privilege and responsibility reserved for them and them alone, so that even the king could not do what the priest is called or ordained to do. A pastor, on the other hand, has been commanded to teach, to preach, to exhort, to evangelize, to comfort, and to rebuke all things that the congregation are called to imitate. They're called to do these things. So that's a quick recap of what we covered in the first two sermons on pastoral ministry. And today what I want to be talking about, what I'm going to talk about, is the process of appointing elders. Okay, what is the process of appointing elders? Generally, when a person is ordained a, um, as a pastor, there's an ordination exam. I don't know, have you guys ever been a part of that process before? There's an ordination exam? No? Yeah, so some of you guys have. Um, it's, during the ordination exam, there's, it, it, there's like a panel of elders, elders from the church, and maybe even elders outside of the church. And what they would do is they would get the candidate and ask him a number of questions. They would ask him num- like theological questions, questions on biblical theology, systematic theology, counseling, church history. They would ask these kinds of questions to see if he knows the Bible well. And they would also ask questions about his personal life. They would also ask questions about his marriage life. And sometimes the exam is held privately. Sometimes it's held um, in front of the entire congregation. So you could kind of come in and out and eat your popcorn while you watch the guy get grilled. <laughs> so it's like an ordination exam. Um, now, again, this, is, this process is more or less a general way that I've seen people get ordained. Um, but if you look in the Bible, there's no strict method and process in appointing elders. Instead, there are general principles in selecting pastors, and every church is going to uniquely apply these principles as best as they can. So here are the three principles. Okay, three principles here. First, the prospective elders must be selected among those who aspire to become an elder and those who fulfill the qualifications of an elder, okay? Prospective elders must be selected among those who aspire to become an elder and fulfill the qualifications of an elder. Second, prospective elders must be appointed by elders. Prospective elders must be appointed by elders. Third, prospective elders must be confirmed by the congregation. Prospective elders must be confirmed by the congregation. All right, so let's get into the first. Prospective elders must be selected among those who aspire to become an elder and who fulfill the qualifications of an elder. Let's first talk about the aspiration, the desire. As I mentioned before, a man is not prophetically called into the ministry. At least that's not the normal process. What is normal is for a man to desire the office, a desire that we would hope is from the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit convicts him. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. A man who is appointed into the office of an elder, he must be a man of conviction. He has to desire it. He has to want it. Because he believes that this is the best way in which he can honor the God whom he loves. He can honor God by serving the body. And this, it might seem obvious, but it, is, it needs to be said. Um... He cannot be an individual who's just pushed into the ministry because there's nobody else to watch over the youth group kids. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Or, or he should, definitely shouldn't be a man who goes into the ministry because he isn't able to do anything else. And pastoral ministry is at least respectable work. Ministry is wrought with all kinds of hardship, pressures, burdens, and temptations so that you have to have a personal conviction that this is the way in which you can honor God. That's what's going to carry you through it. In pastoral ministry, there will be people who slander the minister, deny him, and abandon him. The people that the pastor cares for, teaches, and prays for, these people will sometimes, they won't care much about the work that the pastor does. And the moment that there's a disagreement, the moment there's a disagreement, the moment that there's some kind of displeasure, they just cut out. They just cut out. The people that the pastor pours into will be the very people that doubt his heart. The pastor can give everything that he has to the church. He will invest his time, his resources, his money into the members of the church, give everything that he has. And some members may only see the church as a footnote to the story of their own career. So they only get engaged, they only get involved when it's convenient for them. The pastor will be criticized. He will be scrutinized. His faults are going to be highlighted. People are going to talk about his faults and just take for granted the fact that he has been faithful over a number of years. He'll be blamed when the problem is not fixed. 
when it's not handled in the way that this person wants or this person wants or the way that he wants or she wants or they want it. And all the while, he needs to teach and prepare and to feed the flock. He needs to protect the immature from being swayed and deceived and misled. He needs to guard the members from threats without, but also from threats within. And he's engaged with the world that is hostile to the faith. These are the responsibilities of a pastor. 2 Corinthians, take your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's read from verse 1 to 3. This is what it says. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are a letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. You listen to what Paul's saying, man, it's really sad what this guy's saying, what he's writing. It's like parents trying to convince their kids that they love them. Right? He's saying, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Right? Do we need to prove our love to you? Do we need to show that somehow that we have been faithful? Right? Do we need some kind of letter recommendation to dissipate the doubt that's in your heart? in your mind? He said, you're our letter of recommendation. Your life, the way that you have grown, the way that you have learned the scriptures, the way you have grown closer to Christ, that's a testimony of my love for you. Your life is the recommendation of my love and my faithfulness. Pastoral ministry, as extraordinary as it is, it can be heartbreaking work. So if a man is inducted into the office of an elder, man, he better be convicted of it. He better be convicted of loving the very people who could care less about him sometimes. To feed people who might stray away. To love people who might break his heart. Because he believes that this is the best way in which he can honor and glorify God. He better have a conviction. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 28, take your Bibles there, turn with me. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 28, let's read up to chapter 2, verse 3. Listen to what Paul says here. I want you to listen to his heart because this, is, this needs to be the heart of every pastor. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 to chapter 2, verse 3. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Everyone. Everyone. Verse 29. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those in Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. See, this is the desire of Paul. Him we proclaim, Christ we proclaim, right? that we might present, warning everyone, teaching everyone, that we might present everyone mature in Christ. We proclaim Christ. We proclaim the gospel, we proclaim the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his love and his power. We talk about the hope, we proclaim the hope, the return of the Christ, the establishment of the new heavens and the new earth. We proclaim the gospel so that people might understand more of who Jesus Christ is, see the glory of God, and be transformed into the same image of God. We do it for everyone because we care about everyone. If you look at verse 24, chapter 1, verse 24, listen to what he says. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. For your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. 
Charles Spurgeon, he was the one who says, do not enter the ministry if you can help it. Do not enter the ministry if you can help it. And he knew it because so many people would break his heart. Many people have broken his heart. Many of you guys already know that before I started Cross Life, um, I was two and a half years into the ministry already. And I was about to quit. I was so close to quitting because I got burned. I got burned hard. And the fire wasn't from the world. It was from the people that I loved. It was from the church. People who burned me was my pastor. My pastor. And I looked up to him. I, I loved him. Um, people that burned me were my friends at the church. Even some of my closest friends. At that time, I was thinking about going back into engineering because I knew I could honor God as an engineer. That's what I got my degree in. That was my studies in undergrad. Um, I was at a crossroads again. What am I going to do with my life? And I was praying to God, and I had to confess to him because I knew that the reason why I would pursue a path as an engineer was because I was afraid of getting hurt again. I didn't, I didn't want to go through it. Um, it wasn't, it, wasn't it, it didn't make sense practically. Um, and I knew, but I, again, I knew it was because I was afraid. And so I began to think about what God has given to me, um, my personality, my skills, my training, my education. And he surrounded me still with some godly men, uh, especially my professors who encouraged me to keep going. And so I moved forward, you know, and that's, that's how we started Cross Life, April 24th, 2011. Right? That's when we started, and we celebrated April 24th last week for our 11th year. Um, and I'm grateful that God has directed me in that way, because now, now we're all friends. <laughs> um, I asked Matt, you know, one of the things I always kind of wish I did, I wish I went into industry so that I could know, I know what the world, that world was like. But, you know, Matt, Matt DeFurio was someone who did. He, uh, he worked as a nurse. And I, and I was talking to him, and I said, hey, you know, what, what's more difficult? You working as a nurse or you working as a pastor? And he said, oh, for sure, working as a pastor. Because it's so emotionally burdensome. And um, that's how I know he's a good man for the job. Even though it's not easy, he cares about you enough to press on through it. A man who is to be inducted into the office of an elder must have an aspiration for it. The drive and the conviction must be for a desire to glorify God in serving and loving his church, even laying down everything for the church. A half-hearted desire. Half-hearted desire to go into ministry because you can't do anything else or a perverted desire for respect and power, all of that is going to be swept away once the storm of ministry comes. It's the anchor of the gospel that's going to hold you down. But the aspiration must be backed up by a life that is fit for ministry. Not everyone and anyone who desires to become an elder should be considered for the position of an elder because there are many people who desire a position of authority not to serve God but to serve themselves. They want to, they want to rise up because they want to stroke their ego. They want to be admired by the people around them. Take your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 to 7. Here Paul lays down the qualifications that a man must fulfill before being considered for the position of an elder. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 to 7. It says, therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. A man who desires to be a leader within the church must fulfill the qualifications of 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, I'm not going to get into the list, um, the qualities that are listed here. 
It's going to be a really long series. Uh, But I did go through Titus chapter 1, which also lists out the qualifications of an elder. And you could find that series on our website if if you're interested in that. But I do want to say this. You'll notice that in 1 Timothy 3 that things are divided up into two categories. The first category has to do with character. So a man who must be, who's considered for eldership, he must be sober-minded, gentle. He must not be a lover of money. So these are quali- character qualifications. The second category has to do with ability. He must be someone who is able to teach and somebody who is able to manage his household well. And that makes sense because the pastor must teach the people. He must preach to the people. And he must manage the church. So therefore, he must be able to teach and be able to manage his household. Now, over my years in ministry, I met guys and heard of guys who have extraordinary, extraordinarily gifted, man. They're really good. Really good at preaching, really good at teaching. Sometimes I'm like, man, he doesn't look at his notes at all. It's pretty, it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, they're eloquent. They're dynamic. They're passionate. They're clear. They're logical. But because of the lack of character, they might end up disqualifying themselves morally. Or they fall into bitterness when things get hard because they don't have the character. Um, they're not grounded in the gospel to... to Uh, take on all the criticisms or they end up establishing an authoritarian culture because they're so gifted because they're so talented they just revolve the ministry around themselves and then there are guys who have really beautiful hearts uh, unquestionable character um, but they're like mediocre as leaders Um, they don't know what to do they don't know where to go they don't know how to get there and people get frustrated trying to follow them and these men don't know how to motivate they don't know how to inspire they don't know how to lead and they're oblivious to the needs of the people and, you know, when they teach, nobody knows what they're talking about. Um, so a man who desires to be an elder must have both the character and the abilities of a leader. When we raise up men to the position of an elder, he should be among the best in this church. One of the things, and I mentioned this before, but one of the things that really bothers me, bothers me is when people consider ministry not because they qualify for it, uh, or because they really desire it, but because there's nothing else for them to do. I was really, it's like, hey, this is what I do for a living, man. <laughs> and they, they got nothing else to do, and that, that's why they want to do it. And so they settle for ministry because, again, it's a, at least a respectable job with some authority. Uh, in his book, Lectures to My Student Spurgeon, um, encountered same kind of people, uh, same kind of people. And uh, this is what he said. He said this, This is a sort of model story. Sir, I was put into a lawyer's office, but I never could bear the confinement, and I could not feel at home in studying law. Providence clearly stopped up my road, for I lost lost my situation. And what did you do then? Why, sir, I was induced to open a grocer's shop. And did you prosper? No, I do not think, sir. I was was ever meant for trade. The Lord seemed quite... Uh, quite to shut my way up there, for I failed and was in great difficulties. Since then, I have done little in life assurance agency and tried to get up a school besides selling tea, but my path is hedged up, and something within me makes me feel that I ought to be a minister. My answer generally is, yes, I see you have failed in everything else, and therefore you think the Lord has especially endowed you for the service. But I fear you have forgotten that the ministry needs the very best of men and not those who cannot do anything else pretty big burn. (laughs) This is what he said. Um, The people I want caring for you and watching over you, protecting you, guiding you, leading you, feeding you, being there for you in your times of joy and your sadness, I want them to be the best of men. Okay? That's what you should desire at this church as well. People who will protect you, and care for you, and help you rise up to grow closer to Christ. Now the problem with those who might aspire to become an elder and think that they're fit for the position is that they might have some blind spots. And so we come to the second point where prospective elders must be appointed by elders. Prospective elders must be appointed by elders. Some of the most qualified people to select men for the position of leaders are those who understand the ministry those who understand the responsibility and the burden of leadership. And so the Bible specifically calls elders to appoint elders. In Titus chapter 1, the apostle Paul tells Titus, who was a pastor, he tells Titus to appoint fellow elders. 
in the church on the island, on the churches in the island of Crete. And it says this in Titus chapter 1, verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Appoint elders in every town. In Acts chapter 14, verse 21 to 23, it says this. When they, that is Barnabas and Paul, had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So elders we find appointed elders. Leaders are the ones who appointed leaders because they understand the ministry. They know the qualities that, they should, that should be evident in a person who can fulfill this task. Now, in appointing the elders, what you see practice is that the men laid hands on them. They laid hands on them. So I want to get into a little bit of this. What does it mean to lay hands on uh, um, an elder? In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, it says, Do not be hasty in laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. So it's talking about raising up leaders, laying hands on leaders. Um, now, some theologians are uncertain as to the biblical significance of laying on of hands, but if you do a quick survey, uh, it becomes pretty obvious as to what it means. Um, to lay hands, both in the Old and New Testament, is to select an object or person for a specific purpose. It's a way of selecting something or someone for a specific purpose. That's what it means to lay hands on something or someone. For example, when an Israelite blasphemed the name of God, the witnesses laid hands on the head of the culprit, of the criminal, and the rest of the congregation stoned him. In Leviticus chapter 24, verse 14, it says, Bring out the camp, the one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. So they're basically selecting him, as the one who is guilty of the crime. When an Israelite came to worship God at the tabernacle, he laid his hand on the head of the sacrificial animal. This wasn't a symbol of sin being transferred to the animal. It was just a way of selecting that animal, setting it apart as an offering, as a sacrifice to God. In Leviticus chapter 1, verse 4, it says, He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. In transferring leadership, Moses laid his hand on Joshua, selecting him as a successor for the Lord's service. It says in Numbers chapter 27, verse 18 to 19, So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Make him stand before Eleazar, the priest, and all the congregation, and you shall commission him in their sight. So the practice of laying on of hands was a general expression of appointing or selecting someone or something for a specific purpose, whether it be judgment, an offering, or a job or task. So when the leaders of the church laying their hands on a person to become an elder, they're selecting that man into the service of God. They're appointing the individual for the specific work of pastoral ministry to care for the church saying this is the person who's going to care for the congregation, who's going to feed the congregation, who's going to protect the congregation, exhort the congregation, comfort the congregation. They're acknowledging this man to fulfill the character qualification of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 and acknowledging the fact that he has the ability to teach and is able to manage his household well so that he might be able to manage the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So practically for those of you who are interested in becoming pastors, I haven't come across many of you recently, but if you're interested, you should talk to me. <laughs> right, you should talk to me. Um, and I'll tell you whether I think you are fit for the work of the ministry. Be prepared for a very straightforward response, okay? Over the years, there have been a number of people who've come and asked me about going into pastoral ministry. For a couple of them, you know, they came up to me, expressed their desire, and I told them, why don't you actually start working first? And the reason why I said this is because I haven't had enough time to examine their character and to see whether or not they're fit for the work of the ministry. And that time working will give me time and also them time to assess their own heart, assess their own character, and even assess their skills. And what I would also find is that during their time of work, especially if they go to grad school and establish themselves in a career, it becomes very, very difficult for them to give that up and to go into pastoral ministry unless they have that conviction unless they have that desire. And then there are those who've come up to me and asked me uh, about ministry, and I told them straight up, no, you should not go into the ministry uh, because you're not a leader. 
and uh, nobody follows you. Uh, nobody follows you, and the reason why nobody follows you is because you do not serve, you do not sacrifice, you do not give. Don't expect to lead if you don't know how to serve. Because the heart of biblical leadership is servanthood. The heart of biblical leadership is sacrifice. So if a man does not give everything for the church, what makes him think he's going to do that when he becomes a leader in the church and just has a title? He's going to be thinking about how the congregation can serve him instead of thinking about how he can serve the congregation. I told him, don't go into the ministry. Now, the last principle to consider is that prospective elders must be confirmed by the congregation. They must be confirmed by the congregation. Now, where do I get this from? This is mainly evident from the fact that the character qualifications listed in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 is given to us canonically, okay? Meaning that it's in the Bible, okay? The fact that it's, so Titus and Timothy were the disciples of Paul. Paul is the one who wrote the letter of Titus to Titus, and he wrote the letter of 1 Timothy to Timothy, and he gave them instructions on what to look for in selecting a pastor. But the instructions that he gives to these men individually is ultimately given to the church at large, the universal church, so that we understand what the qualifications of an elder is supposed to be, so that we can assess whether a man fulfills these qualifications. Okay, so the fact that it's given to us in the Bible shows us that we are to know and we are to expect this from our leaders. Furthermore, the qualifications themselves cannot be responsibly and fully acknowledged and recognized by the existing elders without the input of the congregation. Now, take your Bibles, turn with me to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. I figure we just read this one. Titus chapter 1. Let's read from verse 5 through 8. Titus chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. This is what it says. It says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. So to be above reproach means that a man has a life that is beyond legitimate accusation that would otherwise question his fitness for the ministry, right? Meaning, so you basically can't bring a reasonable charge against this guy to disqualify him from the work of God. Now, the qualification of being above reproach only makes sense in the context of community because it's a matter of what people think about him. So you can't check whether a man is above reproach unless you have a good understanding of what people think about him. Do they have a charge against him? Do they have some kind of accusation to bring up against him? Okay. So there has to be, to a degree, some kind of congregational input. And if you look at the other characteristics, you realize that you can only determine if it's true if you ask someone in the church. For example, the elder must be hospitable. How can you check whether the uh, elder is hospitable unless you check with the congregation members to see whether or not he has invited you over to his home and has been hospitable, has been warm and welcoming to you? And so the church, in one way or another, must be involved in affirming and testifying to the qualifications of an elder. So what's the application? Alexander Strzok, in his book, Biblical Eldership, he says the following. The New Testament says very little concerning such detailed procedures as appointing elders. In the same way, the New Testament is amazingly silent regarding specific procedures for administering the Lord's Supper and baptism. Exact procedures for these activities are left to the discretion of the local church. And I agree with that. There's no clear instructions in terms of how to get this done. So this is how we're going to do at Cross Life, okay? So you got the principles laid down. You got it? You got the principles. This is how we're going to do it at Cross Life. Again, I went over this during our, member, uh, uh, our membership, uh, our members meeting, uh, but I want to lay it out from the pulpit here. The first, current elders would nominate an individual who they believe fulfills the qualifications of an elder, okay? And they will present the prospective leaders to the church as an elder candidate. And the selection must be unanimous among the current pastors. In this case, me <laughs> and, and Brian, okay, and Brian, because Brian has been serving as a leader up until now, so practically it makes sense for us to have agreement. And we agree that Matt is qualified. Okay? We agree that Matt is qualified. Now, we will give two years for the members of the church to spend time and to get to know the candidate. And uh, since most of the qualifications has to do with character, it makes sense for there to be an extended period of time for you to examine the character of that individual, right? It makes sense for you to do that. 
I feel like that makes much more sense than having an exam and asking them and going through the list of the qualifications and just affirming them. Okay? I feel like it makes more sense to intentionally say to the church, you guys, check up on Matt, spend time with him, get to know him, get to know his character so that you can affirm that he fulfills these qualifications. Okay? Now, during those two years, we're going to give the person opportunities to teach and to preach so that you know that he knows the Bible and he's able to communicate the Bible. And hopefully you'll have built enough of a relationship with him where you can go up to him and he can give you some counsel. He can personally minister to you with the word of God. Once the two years is up, we'll set up a vote for you guys to express your thoughts on the elder candidates. And, and by you, I mean the members of the church, okay, the members of the church. Um, and if he doesn't get an approval rating of 90%, okay, so we want 90% approval rating. We want to make sure that you guys affirm this, you guys see all of this. So I'm not, I'm not crazy, right? It's not something that I just see. Um, 90% and above. So if he doesn't get 90% and above, then we won't move forward. And uh, we expect everyone to vote uh, because you'll have had two years to get to know the guy. So depending on, on the response of the church, we may revoke the candidacy or ask the brother to work on the concerns, the areas of weakness that prevented him from being appointed, the concerns that you have brought up. So I'll say, hey, no, number of people, you're close, but number of people express these concerns, and we want you to work on it for the next year. Okay? Then we'll take a vote again. And imagine how humbling that is, right? You present it before people, and then people don't think that you're fit for it. It's like, you're, you're humbled, right? You're humbled by that. And then he goes through the process again. That's a good, that's a good thing. Because it's not about his ego. He's going about it because he cares for the people here. Now, again, all of this is to make sure that we are faithful in selecting godly men to serve our Lord's church. And again, this is personal because it's you guys. I want to make sure that you have good leaders. I want you to make sure that you have good leaders overseeing your soul. And so this is what it says in our Constitution, Article 4, Section 1.2. How many of you guys read the Constitution? What? <laughs> I remember I told you guys, read the Constitution, okay? Read the, your pastor with his pastoral authority says, read the Congo Constitution, okay? Read the Constitution. Spend a lot of time on this, okay? And uh, Article 4, Section 1.2, Nomination or Nation of Elders. This is what it says. The elders, by unanimous vote, will nominate to the church men gifted and willing to serve in the office of an elder as elder candidates. Elder candidates will be observed by the congregation for two years so that the members might be able to assess the character of the nominee. Teaching opportunities, including preaching and small group leading, will also be provided for the church body to ensure that the elder candidate is able to teach and is theologically sound. After two years, a congregational vote will be taken to assess the character and the abilities of the elder candidate. The elders will then take the congregational assessment into consideration before making the final decision to publicly ordain the elder candidate into the position of an elder. So that's how we're going to apply the principles. Okay. So, working, so the work of raising up leaders is on us. Okay. And by us, I mean us. Not just me, but it's on all of us. We have a responsibility to make sure that the prospective leaders fulfill the qualifications of an elder because once that man becomes a pastor, he becomes your pastor, the pastor to whom you submit, and he becomes a fellow elder with whom I work and to whom I submit. So you got to be involved. you got to be engaged. But I also want to point out that we as a church have more than just the role of being gatekeepers to the office of authority. There's a responsibility that we have to help men and young men rise up to leadership. There's a responsibility on all, all of us to encourage, to support them as they strive to lead and shepherd the people of God. At the end of the day, pastors are servants of the church. I want you to think about the church. Right? Pastors are servants of the church, and the church is the body of Christ, the people for whom the Lord Jesus Christ has shed his blood. We are a community that have been united mysteriously and spiritually in union with the resurrected Jesus Christ. This is who we are as a church. So to love the church is to honor the sacrifice that was made in order to redeem the church. And to cherish the body of the church is to cherish the head of the church. And so as a church, we must play an active role in exhorting faithful and gifted men to grow in their servant leadership to exhort them, to encourage them, to affirm them, to appreciate their services because they are rising up. We're trying to raise them up to care for the church. 
We care for the church because caring for the church gives glory to Christ who has redeemed the church with his blood. And so in the process, we give opportunities and chances for them to make mistakes and learn. So we've got to be gracious as we raise men up. Okay? You guys got to be gracious. Being patient with them as they learn how to preach and teach instead of complaining about how the lessons might be too basic or not clear or uh, wasn't good compared to other people. Okay? Not having a disgruntled spirit, a critical spirit. By critical spirit, I mean a very caustic one. You know, there's enough people. They come out to this church with a focus on the self. They just come here thinking about themselves, right, what they can get, what blesses them, so that if something's not to their liking, they just kind of cut out and move on. They come in with that attitude. And this self-centered attitude shades their perspective on leaders as well. Right, they measure the value of a pastor or prospective elder based upon his sermonic performance, uh, upon his theological aptitude. And they don't see him as a brother. They don't see him as a brother whom they can help and encourage and support to rise up to become better shepherds. They just think, what's in it for me? Oh, this man's not providing what I want, therefore I move on or I just condescendingly dismiss him. They don't think of him as a brother that they can raise up and lift up and support so that they become a better pastor, a better leader more fit to become an elder. You know, I wouldn't be where I'm at if it wasn't for a number of people who have been patient with me and given me chances. I wouldn't be here if people weren't patient with me as I grew as a preacher, as I grew as a counselor, as an evangelist. I wouldn't be where I'm at if people didn't give me room to grow into maturity as a 25-year-old pastor. I started at 25 years old. I look back, I mean, I was young. But I wouldn't have room to grow if people didn't I wouldn't have matured in the way that I did unless people didn't give me room to grow and mature. And I wouldn't be where I'm at if people just ditched the church because I wasn't married and had kids until my 30s. Right? There are a number of people here I gave premarital counseling to before I got even married. <laughs> you know? I, that's what I did. I officiated their wedding before I even got married myself. But they didn't leave me. They stuck by my side. They loved me as a brother and as a friend. And for that man... I like get a little teary, teary-eyed, but I'm really grateful. A pastor is not a performer or mere lecturer or disseminator of biblical information so that the value is measured by impersonal production or service. What's in it for me? He's a brother that you are to help and to support. He's a co-laborer. Think of, he's a co-laborer with whom you are working to fulfill the great commission. You believe that Jesus Christ died and resurrected. You believe the gospel will save people from their sins, forgive them. It will deliver them from hell. You believe it. Your pastor is a friend and a brother with whom you labor alongside in order to fulfill the Great Commission. So be proactive. You be proactive in raising up faithful leaders at Cross Life. And I say this again, we are going to get God willing duck Matt. And I want you to think, ask yourself, have I been praying for Matt? In what ways have I encouraged him? In what ways have I supported him? Or do I just think, oh, he's a leader. He can handle himself. Right? He's here to help me. How have you as a church been faithful in helping him rise up to become a better shepherd? Okay? So it's a challenge and it's a rebuke, but a gentle rebuke, a rebuke nonetheless. Okay? But it's encouragement and a challenge to you guys. Do it not just for him, before the men that we will, God willing, raise up in the future. One of the things I want you to remember and realize is our role in raising up leaders. It doesn't just have a local impact upon the church, but a generational impact for the believers who will come after us. The work that we do here at Cross Life, as effective as it might be, it's very short-lived. I, I, we, as humans, live only for a few decades. We only live for a few decades. So after we're gone, right, after we're gone, what we physically do, what we do literally is gone with us. And so we need to be faithful in preparing up leaders and passing down the mantle of the gospel to the next generation in order to meet the needs of the church. One of the saddest things that I see is when a church literally, they literally die out. They literally die out because they were not faithful in raising up the next generation. They were not faithful in raising up uh, younger pastors and elders within the church. And so their legacy and their influence and their conviction, they will pass away with them. As a church, we have to be faithful in raising up pastors, not only to the minister to the church with its current needs, but also to carry on the work of discipleship to the next generation. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, it says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men 
who will be able to teach others also. You know, our church has been around for 11 years now, and we're finally in the process of inducting our second elder. Um, and Matt is only 10 years younger than me, so I have a few years ahead on him, but I hope in the years to come we'll, we'll raise up younger pastors, guys who are 20 years younger, 30 years younger than me. But as we grow up, and at that time, you're going to get older. In 30 years from now, you're going to be, what, 50? You know, yeah, yeah. we're all going to be the same age. <laughs> or people, the college students are going to think we're the same age, okay? So uh, they're going to clump us up into the same group of people. But I don't want you to think, oh, this young whippersnapper, what does he have to teach me? Yeah? What does he have to teach me? Oh, there's nothing he can, I have more experience than him. I'm wiser than him. Why is he called to be an elder, not me? I'm more experienced. I hope you will have a heart of humility where he says we need to raise him up in order to continue the work of the gospel ministry when I'm dead. <laughs> because it's not just about what we do right now. It's making sure that the mantle of the gospel continues and carries on in generations to come. You know, I'm humbled that many men here, again, it's been 11 years, many of you have grown and matured. For that, I'm grateful, and I know our elder team is going to continue to grow. And other areas of leadership is going to be filled as well. So for all of us, be engaged and be mindful in raising up these people, encouraging them, supporting them, loving them, ministering to them, comforting them, for the sake of the church now and for generations to come, for the glory of our King. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our time. In the word, to study. Study this process of, of uh, appointing elders in the church. And I thank you for the principles that you give to us. It's clear, it's straightforward. And um, Lord, without the roadmap, we would be lost. So thank you for loving enough us enough to, to reveal these truths to us. And I pray for uh, our brother Matt. Thank you for him and all the work you have done in his life, how you have carried him through difficult times. Give him the strength and the will to rejoice when times are hard, to bear the burdens of the weak. And I pray, Lord, that you will continue to strengthen him, continue to encourage him, continue to set his eyes on the glory of the gospel that he will press forward even when times are hard. And I pray for our congregation that we would be faithful in lifting him up, raising him up, encouraging him, supporting him, affirming him. And not just him, Lord, but the leaders that are yet to come. Knowing that, God, as we raise up strong and faithful leaders within the church, pastors within the church, God, we are not only protecting and shepherding and comforting and guiding and teaching the church now, but we are preparing the church for generations to come. Thank you again, Jesus Christ, for dying upon the cross. It is your church, and we know and we're confident that you will build it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.